Now that we have a main idea about this, we can look at the inner workings of the algorithm. So again, this is the big picture. So we have key schedule here, which is consists of two permutations, PC1 and PC2, and only rotation, sometimes one bit to the left, sometimes two bit to the left. We have initial and final permutation, which are actually has no cryptographic importance. We have the expansion algorithm here and the S box and permutation layer here. So let's focus on this part. The picture for actually the whole thing, this run function is something like this. You have the right 32 bits and the expansion function actually uh, duplicates some of the bits. So 32 bits become 48 bits. Then this 48 bit is exhort with the run key, which is again 48 bits. Then this four, these 48 bits are put inside eight different S boxes. So the input of these S boxes are six bits, but they produce four bit out. So after the S box layer, you have again 32 bits. Then you have a permutation on these 32 bits, which is actually the uh, linear layer. So expansion, key XOR, S box layer, and permutation layer. So let's look at all of these parts in detail. So the right 32 bits uh, are put inside the run function here, and the output is XOR to the left 32 bits. So let's look at the initial permutation. The following initial permutation is applied to the plain text. So 48 bit of the input is moved to the bit position one. The fifth bit of the input is moved to the position two, and so on. So this is the uh, table for it. But uh, the final permutation is the inverse of this permutation. So it is not much of difference, as much of a difference, but important thing is that this permutation has no cryptographic importance. And I think I will be mentioning it here. Yes. After round 16, a final permutation, which is the inverse of initial permutation is applied to the output to provide the ciphertext. When the attacker has a ciphertext block, let's say, they can undo the IP inverse part. So you can perform the uh, final permutation in the reverse order. Or if you have the plain text block, you can also perform this initial permutation yourself. So if you go back to the picture, if the attacker know the plain text block, they can perform this operation because this is not just a permutation. It has no secret key involved. So you can know the values here and here. And similarly, if you know the ciphertext block, you can go backwards and obtain this part. So this part has no cryptographic importance. So in a chosen text attack, initial permutation and the final permutation have no cryptographic value. But uh, these permutations are used to read data in a better way in hardware. Yes, here it is explained. However, this is designed for hardware and IP is de designed so that it provides a suitable ordering of bits when loaded from input device to the desk chip. So this is why we have these permutations. Again, for analysis, uh, we can just forget them. Let's look at the key schedule. 64 bit user key is taken, but the most significant bits of the bytes are used for parity. So the effective key is uh, 56 bits. So this parity check is just used for error checking. First permutation PC1 is applied to remove the most significant bits and permute the 56 bits, which are actually used in the encryption. Then 56 bit key is divided into two halves, 28 bit parts, and they are rotated by RI after round I, but this uh, number is sometimes one and sometimes two. A permutation PC2 is applied to obtain 48 bit round key. So this is the uh, numbers of rotations that you used in the rounds. So in the first two rounds, you just rotate to the left one bit, in the other ones, two, one, two, and so on. So you apply the PC1 permutation to the two parts of 28 bits and PC2 to the final 48 bits. And these permutations are uh, again, uh, given as a table here. So the, our notation are still the same. 
57 bit is put as the first bit and so on. So the ordering is like first bit, second bit, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. So it goes in this way. So frequency of key bits are somewhat important. So what we're trying to say is that every key bit should have almost equal effect on round keys because you have 64 bit secret key actually, which is 56 bits for death and these bits affect round keys, but uh, we should know uh, which bit affects how many round keys. So this is why we set the frequency of key bits and analysis performed. So we thought that the, uh, for the 64 user supply key, the parity bits, the most significant bits of the bytes are never used in the key sketches. So it's FX zero runs. And the uh, key bits 3, 42, 52 and 58 are the least used key bits because they are used in TWAF round keys and the others are uh, seen in 13, 14 and 15 times. So it is somewhat actually looks good. I mean, there isn't any V key bits that is only appeared in one or two round keys and so on. So this is like a design criteria. So let's look at the run function of this. We have seen the key schedule. Now we can move on to the run function. The run function of this contains the following of four operations, expansion, key addition, substitution, and permutation. Expansion is as follows. 32-bit input, which is the right half of the intermediate block value, is expanded to the 48-bit intermediate value by duplicating its 16 particular bits. And these bits are provided in a minute. Then the design rational is as follows. Any two neighboring S boxes share two input bits. So for this reason, this is the expansion. So 32nd bit, of the input is moved to the bit position one and 47. So you see the 32 second bit here, but also here. You see the first bit of the input in the positions two and 48 here, but the second bit of the input is moved to only to position, bit position three because not every bit is duplicated on the uh, half of it. So this is why some bits appear only once, like the second bit, but some bits appear twice, like the first bit. So this is the expansion. Next thing is that now that you have 48 bits, next thing is to XOR the 48 bit intermediate value with the round key. Round keys are generated by the key schedule algorithm, which we have already seen. The 48 bits are split into, now we move on to the substitution layer, which is actually where the security of the cipher comes from. The 48 bits are split into eight groups of six bits and used as the inputs of eight different S boxes. S boxes have dimensions six times four, so their input is six bits and the output is four bits. Thus the concatenated outputs provide 32 bits of intermediate value. Security depends on the S boxes since they are the only nonlinear part of the cipher. A six times four S box can be seen as four, four times four S boxes. I will give it uh, in a table in the next slide. The outer two bits of every six bits represent the S box to be used and the inner four bits are taken as the input. So what do we mean by this? So if the six bit input of your S box is this, for example, you look at the leftmost and the rightmost bits, which is one zero, as seen here. And in, if you write it in, think about integer, this is two. So now you use the uh, S box is P2. And your input to P2 is this, the middle four bits. So here is an example. So if you look at the first S box of this, the inputs can take values from 0 to f, which are the 16 values. And uh, we can divide the S box into four parts like this, p0, p1, p2, and p3. If you go back to the example, the leftmost and rightmost bit actually shows you which S box to be used. It is p2, and you use this uh, row, actually. So in our example, the input is 1110, which is e. So the input is E and we are using P2, so the output is five. 
This is how we use the S box. But this is the table for S1, and we have six different S boxes for this. Next layer is permutation layer. A bit level permutation is applied to the 32 bit intermediate value according to the following table. It will be given in a minute, and this provides diffusion. And the table is as follows. This is the permutation. Again, the 16 bits of the input is moved to the bit position one, seven bits is moved to the bit position two, and so on and so forth. So if you go back to the picture, we talk about the key schedule. We have the uh, permutations PC1 and PC, PC2, and we know which number of rotations to be performed from the table we have given. We know how the expansion works. We have the key XOR, and here we have the S boxes and the permutation, again, which that is given in this picture. Again, this picture is from uh, TIGS for cryptographers. So as you can see, we perform the expansion, we exhort the 48 bits with the round key. Then we perform eight, sorry, I think in the previous slide I said six, but we have eight different S boxes for this. And they all take four bits, sorry, six bit input, but they provide four bit output. And we have seen the example for S1. And uh, the remaining S boxes have somewhat similar properties with S1. And these are the S boxes that are modified by NSA. They are not the initial design by IBM. So what about the security and why these, uh, we have these choices actually? Because you can modify the algorithm of this and provide some kind of a different cipher, but how could we know that, that it makes it uh, better or worse? So for this reason, we have cryptanalysis and designers should have a reasoning for their actions. So uh, designers revealed some design criteria about S boxes. No S box is a linear, and they didn't want to give the idea of differential cryptanalysis, so they only revealed the following information. No S box is a linear or affine function of the input. Changing one bit in the input to an S box changes at least two output bits. The S boxes were chosen to minimize the difference between the number of ones and zeros when any single bit is held constant. For any S box, SX and SX XOR, this value differ in at least two bits. For any S box S, SX is never equal to the SX XOR, this value for any binary values of R and S. So these are some uh, design criteria because they think that such properties, if they had existed, they would make the cipher weak. And some revealed design criteria about permutation. Four bit output of an S box affect six different S boxes in the following round. So this is a good permutation. Four boxes directly to via the expansion. If an output bit from S box I affects one of the two middle input bits to S box J in the next round, then an output bit from S box I cannot affect the middle bit of S box I. The middle six inputs to Two neighboring S boxes, those not shared by any other S boxes, are constructed from the outputs from six different S boxes in the previous round. The middle 10 bits to three neighboring S boxes, four bits from the two outer S boxes, and six from the middle S box, in other words, those not shared by any other S boxes, are constructed from the outputs from all S boxes in the previous round. So actually, these properties are not. Uh, directly important to us. I'm just showing you that there was a reasoning behind the choices of the permutations. They are not just randomly chosen. Uh, they are chosen because the designers had some kind of criteria uh, because they think that these criteria will provide better security. But still, this has some weaknesses. And one of them is the complementation property. Let P bar represent the bitwise complement of B. So a bitwise complement is that if the, the complement of the zero bit is one and the complement of one is zero. So if you have such an encryption of a plain text block, so let's say that your plain text block is P, your key is K, and the cipher text block is C. So if you take the complement of this P, and if you take the complement of your key, 
and perform the encryption, it turns out that the ciphertext block is just a complement of C. So this is someone kind of a strange property. Direct consequences are as follows. Attacker can use this property to, to half, half the cost of exhaustive key search. So instead of two to the 56 time complexity for the exhaustive key search, for this, it is two to the 55 if you capture this, have the ciphertext and plain text blocks actually. And another consequence is that implementer can use this property to check if the implementation is correct. So it is kind of a way of saying it is not a bug, it is a feature, but of course it is a bug. Also, uh, people discovered weak keys for this. A key K is called a weak key if encrypting twice with it leaves the plain text unchanged for this. So, the, I mean, this is not the general definition of a weak key, but for this, we observe such a property. So, you take the plain text P, you XOR it with your K, and the output ciphertext block, if is also encrypted again by the same key, you return back to your initial plain text block P. So people said that these kind of key keys are weak. So they, this has the following for weak keys. But the important thing is that each weak key has two to the 32 fixed points. So for these four keys, there are two to the 32 plain text blocks P and it is encrypted. The resulting cipher takes just the equals to the plain text, which is a real weakness because you are performing an encryption operation but the plain text does not change. But of course, for not all of the two to the 64 possible plain text blocks, but only the square root of them. So here I'm providing again some test vectors to check if uh, you implement this. You, from here, you can check if it is implemented correctly. So for our example, we chose the plain text block as this and the key uh, as this. And round keys becomes this, and the round outputs becomes this. So this last value is actually the ciphertext block. So if you encrypt this plain text block with this key, this is your ciphertext block. So uh, standards and NIST documents always contain uh, these uh, test vectors so that uh, implementers can check if they perform the encryption operation in a correct way. So we've said that this is now broken because the key is really short and people try to strengthen this. This was deployed in many applications and it wasn't easy to change it with another cipher because at the software level, you can easily do it. You can implement a new cipher. I mean, sometimes it is not that easy because if you're using it in an operating system and so on, it's not that easy to replace that algorithm with something else. But in uh, small applications so at the software level, this is easy. You can get rid of some algorithm and move on to new one. But at the hardware level, it is not that easy. You have to build the device again. So this is why it is not an easy task to uh, stop using one cryptographic algorithm and move to another one. In order to overcome the exhaustive search for the 56-bit key DES, multiple DES encryption with different keys are suggested. But the expected security level is not possible in practice. For instance, double encryption with two keys does not provide 112 bit security. So uh, this is really important. Currently, the most used DES variant, which is also standardized by NIST, is the triple DES algorithm. So it works like this. Instead of using single DES, you have to perform three DES. So you, for this reason, you have to choose three keys all of them are 56 bits. And using this, a plain text, plain text is encrypted with K1, decrypted by K2, and then encrypted with K3 to obtain ciphertext. So in, for this example, the triple this is represented EDE because it is encryption, decryption, encryption. So it works like this. You take the plain text, and in this picture, I think the keys are ordered in a different way, but you encrypt it with one of your keys, you decrypt it with your second key and you encrypt it with your third key. So you don't have to use decryption here. You can also perform encryption, so you can use it EEE, -E -E, but this choice has some uh, backward compatibility, which we are going to mention in a minute. 
So triple test is still a standard. It is a standard until 2030. And when uh, at the year of 2030, if we think that uh, the cipher is still secure, probably they will extend this uh, standard to 2040 or 50 or even 2060. So we have backward compatibility. If you choose all of the three keys equal to itself, so which means that you are actually choosing a single desk key, then performing triple desk operation becomes ident identical to desk. So in terms of security, EDE is no different than EEE, but we lose the backward compatibility. So if we go back to the definition, let's say that key one equals to key two and key three. So if you encrypt a plain text block with a key, then decrypt it with the same key, you end up with the P itself. And then if you encrypt it again, this means that you are performing a single desk operation. This is why ED is uh, preferred in uh, real life. So here's the uh, security of the desk variant. So if you use this uh, two times, uh, we expect that the brute force attack should require two to the 112 encryptions. But there is a variant of the attack where you perform some pre-computations and uh, record everything to some kind of a memory. Then the attacks, the time complex the attack reduces to the same as this. So if you combine these two, it becomes two to the 57. So it is not that hard to perform this. So a double desk can be broken easily. This is why we move to the triple desk. And uh, for the triple desk, what we have is this. Okay. If you use three different keys, uh, the and if you do some pre-computations and keep them in the memory, the time complex the attack reduces to the two to the power one hundred and twelve. This is why we say the triple desk provides one hundred and twelve bit security. And uh, looking at the current technology, we assume that nobody has the computational power to perform this many encryptions in a meaningful uh, time period. For this reason, triple desk is still a standard. And actually, if you are using a credit card that has, that has the NFC capability so that you can perform contactless payments, most probably uh, there is triple desk algorithm inside it. If it is not triple desk, then it should be AES. So we are still using it in practice. So this is why uh, I actually mentioned this algorithm in this course, because uh, it is one of the standards that we are constantly using it in real life. 